Afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about low back pain. How many people here have ever had an episode of low back pain? Lots of you. That's what I thought. If you look at the incidence of low back pain, about 80% of you are going to have low back pain at some point during your life. It's the second most common reason for seeing a physician. It's the second most common reason for a disability with over 100 million lost work days a year. And it's also um, tremendously expensive. It's in the neighborhood of $100 billion a year we spend on, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on low back pain. Um, you know, I forgot, the, I don't, <laughs> I do have a clicker. Um, there's also, you know, if you have low back pain, Chances are uh, it'll go away in about three weeks. However, if it lasts more than six weeks, then it, then it becomes chronic. And at that point, that's when we worry. That's when you can have chronic problems. If it lasts more than six weeks uh, and you have surgery, the chances of a surgery working to make you better are about 50%. As a matter of fact, if you have an MRI or a CT scan to try and figure out what's wrong, it's about uh, a 10 to 15% chance they even know what's wrong with you. So, the, the odds are not in your favor if you have back problems. So we've been talking about the physical aspects of back pain. Uh, what about the emotional aspects of back pain? Poor doggy, right? <laughs> we know that emotion could actually influence what happens in your brain. As a matter of fact, emotion could present an overlay on top of the physical pain you're feeling, and it can actually change the way your brain works. So if you look at the brain on the left here, uh, that's somebody who's got what we call central sensitization compared to a normal person on the right. What this means is even after the stimulus is gone, even after the, back, the root of the back pain is gone, you could still be experiencing low back pain. So there seems to be an interaction between the mind and the body there. Now let me talk a little bit about how this works. So you know, we're typically concerned about the disc. If you look at the spine, you have 24 vertebrae, and in between each one of these vertebrae is a little disc, which is sort of like a shock absorber. And if we look at this in close-up, um, we can see that there's good space in between those vertebral bodies that is offered by the disc. And we also see that you have these little tubes or cables that come out of the spinal cord. And these go down to serve different parts of your body. And if you put pressure on that, that's when you have a problem, sort of like you see at the bottom right here. So as a matter of fact, here's somebody who had a, a rupture of the disc. It's pushing against that nerve root, and that's when you get things like sciatica going down your leg. And, uh, but you don't get there just from doing one event. For example, you know, you're in the top left there before you lift something, and you're in the bottom right after you lift something. It's really kind of a gradual process. So the first thing that happens is you start to lose disc height. Then the next thing that happens is you start to get a little instability between those vertebrae. And so at that point, they could slide over and start problems. And if you're very unlucky, then you could get to that point where you have the vertebral, uh, where you have the rupture of the disc, and that's when things are bad. That's when you need surgery. So how does this all occur? In order to understand how this occurs, we have to understand something about the anatomy of the disc and uh, how it gets its nutrition. If you look at the disc, it's almost like a tire that you lay on his side, okay? So it's got lots of, of uh, cross-hatch fibers, which are like plies of that tire. And in the center, you've got a gelatinous core. And it also has this, this tiny cap on the top called an end plate. And that end plate is only about a millimeter thick, and its uh, purpose in life is to diffuse nutrients into that disc. The disc itself has no blood supply like most parts of your body. So how does it get its nutrition? Well, it gets them from the vertebrae above and below, and basically what happens is these nutrients go through that end plate and nourish those fibers and make the disc happy. Now, we also get vertebral end plates. How many people here have had a vertebral end plate microfracture? Okay. How many people here have ever lifted anything heavy? Okay, you've probably had a vertebral end plate microfracture, but you just don't know it because we don't have any nerve sensors or what we call um, nociceptors in that part of the body. And it's okay if you get one of those, it'll heal, but what if your job requires you to get lots of these things? Well, these things will heal, 
but they heal in the form of scar tissue. And one of the things we know about scar tissue is it's thicker and denser than most other types of tissues in the body. And so what do you think happens to those nutrients when they try and pass through this end plate? Well, some of them make it through, some of them don't, and subsequently we get atrophy of the disc fibers, parts of the disc die off, that's how we get weak discs, and that's how things uh, uh, get bad in terms of uh, ruptures. So as engineers, what we try and do is figure out when you're gonna have this. So as an engineer, what we do is look at the load imposed on those tissues of the body compared to the tolerance. And so here's typically the way to look at things. Here's the tolerance of a tissue. Here's the, the load of a tissue. And if you exceed, the, if the load exceeds that tolerance, then you're gonna feel pain. So what we try and do is design jobs so those loads are well below there. Now, here's the way we analyze this in the laboratory. If you can see in the little window there, you see somebody doing a physical task. And we have markers on his body. We have electrodes on his body to look at muscle activities. You see the little contrails of the motion. We could precisely understand what somebody does. And uh, this accuracy is tremendously accurate. It's down to about a, a third of a millimeter of accuracy. So what we do, what we do with that information is we build a physical model or a computer model of this person. And these things are proportioned relative to the size, shape, proportions of the individual. And you can see there we have the forces going in and out of the hands. We have the muscles that we're getting from the electromyography. We have motion. And then we could do something with these models that you can never do in real life, which is you could look inside there and measure exactly what's going on. So every one of these little red arrows is basically a vector of force that is uh, being imposed on the disc. And you can see these things are straight back when he, this guy starts to pull. And then you see him swing to the side. That's because he's taking a step with one of his legs. So it shows how incredi incredibly accurate we can get with these. As a matter of fact, we also do this for patients. So here's a patient. This is a patient's particular spine in the, um, in the model with all the wear and tear and degeneration. And you can see we see muscles, which are the red arrows, bone contacts, which are blue. The green that you'll see here in a minute are going to be ligament forces. And you see the discs actually deforming, changing colors so we can tell what the stress is there. So what do we do with this information? Well, we use it to interpret what happens when people are exposed to various risk factors. Um, so the one everybody knows about are physical factors, right? Um, so physical factors, we know the, the heavier something is that you lift, the more load there's gonna be on the spine, but it's not quite that simple. Yes, that is true, but take a look at the standard deviation, these black bars on top of each one of the red bars. Those are standard deviation bars which show how much it varies, but you see those are tremendous. So you could have a, a load that's very high or very low, but on average, it's going to be one of these. We also know things like where you lift to and from is very important. So you can see that actually has more of an influence than the weight of the object. Um, what about things like individual factors? Well, these are things like your genetics. We can't really do much about that other than try and understand what it means for you. But there are things you do have some control over. For example, here's a little study we did looking at BMI, body mass index, or how obese a person is. And the zero here is if you're of the ideal level, which are the green bars, and the blue shows what happens if your BMI is increased by five, the red shows what happens if it's increased by 10, and you can see these are nonlinear jumps. The jump from the green to the blue is moderate, the, drum, the jump from the blue to the red are excessive. Okay, so it's a nonlinear hazard to put on more body weight in terms of your spine. We also know that your previous experiences, like if you've had low back pain, could influence things. Um, loads are from 30 to 70% more when you've had low back pain before and you're doing a task. The last one here is psychosocial and organizational factors. What are those things? Psychosocial factors are uh, basically the way you relate to the social issues around you, how you interrelate with your boss, how you relate with your spouse or your friends or your coworkers. And the literature has shown that all these independently lead to back pain, but we couldn't figure out why, so we did a couple studies. And uh, this is uh, kind of interesting because what we did is we worked with a psychosocial expert who trained my experimenters or my graduate students how to, how to treat people and be very engaging and have a positive psychosocial environment. So they'd bring, we'd wire up a subject like you just saw, 
have them do some uh, exertions in the laboratory, and we'd be very engaging. So my graduate student would look at them in the eye, they'd whistle, they'd turn on the radio, make small talk with them, do whatever they can to make them feel comfortable. So they went through, did some exertions. And then halfway through the experiment, I walk in the room, and I start yelling at the graduate student. You know, I start saying things like, Bob, you'll never graduate. You don't do it like this, you do it like that. And I'm not that bad of a guy. It's really all sort of a, a staged uh, event. And so we go out of the room, we pretend we're having this big argument, uh, just leave the subject in the room all wired up to think about what he just saw. And all the, the negative uh, hostility was directed at the graduate student, not the subject. And so after about five minutes, the graduate student goes back in the room and he proceeds to say, we got to do this again. That's all he says. Turns off the radio, stops looking at the person in the eye, stops the small talk, stops the whistling, and all he says is, we got to do this again. So they do the same exact experiment again, and here are the results. The red diamonds are the stress sessions, the blue squares are the unstressed sessions, and if you look at this, for some people, there's a huge jump. The stress session being generally more stressful than the unstressed. For other people, they're light on top of each other. Why the difference? Well, it turns out it was all due to your personality. Introverts, it, it, we had a huge jump in terms of the loads on the spine in the introverts. With the extroverts, they couldn't care less. Okay. Same thing with in, intuitors and sensors. So what's happening here? What's the common thread amongst all these risk factors? Well, the common thread is the way the body and the mind particularly in, um, interprets information. So we get the information about the world from the, what we hear, what we see, what we feel, what the emotions are, and our brain processes this and recruits the muscles in the torso. And the muscles are what really load the spine. And what happens with people who have higher levels of stress is we have more what we call co-contraction. So these muscles in your torso are actually playing a little tug of war with, you, with each other, which greatly increases the stress as opposed to what it really takes to perform the task. And that's how these increased loads occur, and that's how it's, it's tied to the brain. So what do you do about this? Well, wellness is a great start. What is wellness? Wellness is taking care of all the different parameters of your life. So, you know, occupation, social, spiritual, physical, intellectual, uh, medical, uh, financial. Everything's got to be in balance. And if all these parts of your life are in balance, then the way your mind processes information, recruits those muscles, and co-contracts to load the spine are all in balance too, and you minimize the loads on the spine that way. And as a matter of fact, here at Ohio State, we have a, a huge emphasis right now on wellness. And this is part of why we do. It's because we know this is very, very important in terms of what it does for the day in and day out stress on the body, including physical loads. So my message then is, if you want to balance, control your back pain, balance your life. That's what it's all about. Thank you for your attention.